Unit 2, Contemporary West, Age of Exploration Lecture. Catalysts of Maritime Voyages are where we're going to begin. Between 1095 and the 1200s, the Crusades that we've talked about before fostered a renewed interest in goods from Asia, and this will lead Europeans to seek all water routes to get to Asia. As we know, a lot of the Italian traders had uh, dominated the trade that was going through the Mediterranean region between the Eastern and Western world. And there were a lot of nations that wanted to cut out those Italian middlemen out of that trade and find their own all water routes to Asia. The Muslims controlled this area as well. Europeans sought things like gold, spices, new technologies, and suitable lands to grow sugar and coffee. These are all part of the catalysts for these maritime voyages. Europeans believed it was their duty also to spread Christianity to new lands, competing with Islam in the South and in Southeast Asia, but also, as we know, competing against the Protestants within Europe. Newly designed ships like the Caravelle the Karak and the Flute were versatile and could carry large cargoes as well. Here's the Flute, there's the Caravelle, and there's the Karak. New ships with different kinds of sails uh, and new technologies to be used to cross uh, bigger expansions of water. New ships used improved rudders as well as Latin sails that could move on pulleys. Uh, and they also used cannon that they could fight against other ships for dominance on the sea. All of these uh, um, technologies transferred from Asia as well. So that increased contact between the Eastern and the Western world due to the Crusades introduced a lot of these technologies to Western Europe that they could then use to help them in the age of exploration. The compass and the astrolabe, also from Asia, uh, also increased availability of maps, also aided the explorers. This is all thanks, of course, to the printing press, which also helped explorers. One could go on an expedition, could come back and draw new maps of what they saw, and then later explorers could use those new maps to go even further, come back and draw their own maps, etc., etc. All right, so let's talk about the motives and the means for the Age of Exploration to begin. Um, five European powers uh, really got involved in this early on as we go into the 16th century, the 1500s. It really begins in the late 15th century or 1400s, led by the nations of Portugal and Spain. And these five European powers, but especially these two to start, off, start it all off, engaged in, in this age of exploration. All of them will rise to new economic heights as a result of this age of exploration and become dominant movers and shakers on the continent of Europe. Motives for European exploration include God, glory, and gold, or sometimes called gold, glory, and God. Uh, all of these motives will be discussed as we go through this unit. But of course, the gold portion is the, the economic interest, the wealth that can be acquired by participating in the age of exploration. Um, Europeans wanted to expand trade and locate direct water routes, like I said, to the uh, goods that they could get from Asia. Uh, things like spices and precious metals, but also silks and other things that they could get from Asia. That included India and China. Uh, that, so there's the gold portion. The God portion of the three G's, if you will, was the religious zeal. Explorers such as Hernan Cortez, as we'll discuss later, other conquistadors like him, were interested in sharing the Catholic faith with the native populations they came into contact with. Um, in some cases, it's not so much that they are wanting to share, 
the religion as it is they want to use the religion as a means to an end to pacify the native populations to make it easier to dominate them. There was also, of course, the other G, an increased desire for grandeur and glory with the spirit of adventure. And this is also a direct connection back to the Renaissance ideal of people wanting to be known for their accomplishments. The idea that man, by his basic nature, is good and man can do great things and he should be uh, recognized for his accomplishments. So gold, glory, and God, all three um, motives there. The way I have them listed there is more like gold, God, and, and um, glory, however. Th those three Gs are the primary motives for the age of exploration that dominated the majority of the 16th century, the 1500s. So let's start with Portugal, this race for riches or dominance of trade with the Eastern world, in particular the spices and other luxury items they could get. It starts with Portugal. Portugal will take the lead in European exploration under the leadership of Prince Henry the Navigator. Uh, Portuguese ships traveled along the western coast of Africa, finding gold and other goods. Uh, Portugal, of course, at the um, edge of Spain on the Iberian Peninsula, uh, it makes sense that they would go down the coast of Africa to try to get around the, the tip of Africa. They did not really recognize how large Africa was, so it took quite some time for them to uh, round the tip of Africa. Uh, it finally happens when in 1488 when Bartholomew Diaz rounded the southern tip of Africa and it will be referred to as the Cape of Good Hope from that point forward. Ten years after that another Portuguese explorer named Vasco da Gama will be able to travel around the Cape of Good Hope uh, that southern tip of Africa and eventually go into the Indian Ocean and land in India by 1498. This will allow for Portugal to dominate the spice trade in Europe, cutting out those Italian middlemen, uh, not having to worry about crossing through the Muslim territories overland, not having to worry about those Italian middlemen in the Mediterranean, cutting out the Mediterranean voyages altogether and finding their own direct water route to India. By 1500, Pedro Cabral, another Portuguese explorer, accidentally discovered the coast of Brazil in South America, claiming it for Portugal. This happens because the Portuguese simultaneously with sending explorers south to go around Africa and into the Indian Ocean were also sending boats um, westward to thinking that if they sailed westward in the Atlantic Ocean that it would eventually um, they would eventually reach Asia in China. Uh, they did not even realize that there were two full continents over here that they didn't even realize were there North and South America nor did they realize that there was a whole nother ocean um, between North and South America and Asia, the Pacific Ocean. That will eventually be discovered by a Spaniard named Balboa. So the Portuguese, as I said, it captured the important port city of Maleca in the Malay Peninsula as well. This will help them to dominate the spice trade as well, not just in India, but also in Southeast Asia. This will enable the Portuguese to control all of that spice trade. It had been dominated for centuries by the Arab traders, and this will allow them to cut out the Arab trader, traders as middlemen as well. The Portuguese will use seamanship, the fact that they built good boats uh, that were very seaworthy for long voyages. They also have at their disposal guns and cannon, gunpowder, that they, of course, get from Asia uh, after the Crusades. We also know that, um, however, they uh, will have to also use treaties to control the spice trade with all of the um, local populations that they come into contact with. So oftentimes they will make these treaties with local populations. Once they get what they want, they will break treaties. Making and breaking treaties was something that uh, was very common and of course very Machiavellian at the same time as we know. 
However, they did not have the people, wealth, or desire to expand their empire in Asia and start colonies. So what we see with the Portuguese is they were not conquerors, but they instead built trade forts designed to control trade routes along the coastline of most of the territories where they explored, along the coast of Africa, into the Southeast Asian islands, and into the southern tip of India. This is why we refer to the Portuguese empire as a trading post empire instead of a colonial empire. They did not really establish colonies where they transplanted large amounts of Portuguese people to live there. Um, instead, just trading posts dominated by merchants. As a result, of all of this, the center of the European trade shifted away from the Mediterranean Sea that had been dominated by those Italian city-states to the Atlantic Ocean. And the Portuguese port of Lisbon will be the most prosperous port in Europe because of that, cutting out those Italian middlemen. We also see that the Portuguese will end the monopoly that Venice, Genoa, and the Muslims had on trade with Asia, and Portugal becomes dominant in that trade. Now, of course, because Portugal uh, had so much success by the end of the 1400s, Spain will also want to get in on this uh, race, if you will, for territories, for dominance of this trade. And it all begins actually with an Italian um, explorer. Uh, he's from Genoa. His name is Christopher Columbus. He actually was from Genoa, but he sailed for Spain. Uh, the Spanish king and queen, Ferdinand and Isabella, funded the voyages of Christopher Columbus. Um, and ultimately, the design was to sail westward, hoping to reach China, just like we had seen an earlier Portuguese explorer that discovered Brazil had done. So this is happening almost exactly the same time. Um, 1492 is when Columbus will launch his first voyage, searching for that western route to Asia. And lo and behold, he lands in Cuba and Hispaniola and in the Bahamas, those areas. He actually had four different voyages, so explored the entire Caribbean island islands area, first thinking that he had reached the Indies, uh, and so uh, ultimately he will refer to the people living there as Indians, which they are not, um, the native populations, but uh, erroneously he will think he had reached the Indies. Um, as I said before, eventually it will be determined that they are not in the Indies, that they have discovered a whole new territory that they didn't even know existed in the world, the new world as it will be called. As I said before, Christopher Columbus was from Genoa. He used a lot of maps from the ancient Greek world since he was a byproduct of that Italian Renaissance that uh, was very much using the old Greek uh, and Roman uh, manuscripts as well as their maps. Uh, these, the ancient Greek Ptolemy had actually drawn a lot of maps that Christopher Columbus will use, and then Christopher Columbus will draw new maps for what he sees and what he finds. Um, he thought by looking at these earlier maps, though, that he could sail west to Asia faster than going to the east, not really recognizing how large the globe was. Columbus's four voyages propelled Spain to the front forefront of European exploration, conquest, and settlement. Spain will be different than Portugal because they will establish a colonial empire, meaning sending Spanish settlers to go and settle in these new lands, rather than just establishing smaller trading posts. Eventually, after uh, Columbus's initial successes, within a generation, other Spanish explorers will start to explore that new territory that had been um, found by uh, Columbus and um, earlier explorers. The Spanish explorer Ferdinand Magellan will actually extend even beyond the New World. He will sail around South America and into a new ocean, the Pacific Ocean. Magellan is credited with being the first person to circumnavigate the globe, 
in 1519. Circumnavigate just means sail all the way around the globe, circumference of the globe. Although he himself did not actually make it back to Spain, by the time he got to the Philippines, the, the native Phil, um, those natives in the Philippines actually were not real happy with him, and he ended up um, being murdered by them and eaten by them, cannibals. But his men were able to escape, and his ships were able to make it back to Spain. So uh, Magellan's uh, crew... Uh, made it back, so Magellan is given credit for being the first to circumnavigate the globe. In 1494, Portugal and Spain, uh, because they both had sailed westward and they both had actually landed in the New World, uh, as I mentioned before, Cabral had uh, landed in Brazil, uh, they started to duke it out a little bit over who was going to dominate which territories that were being explored. So both of them being Catholic nations, of course, this is prior to the Protestant Reformation, so they were all Catholic at this point, but in 1494, both Portugal and Spain uh, agreed to appeal to the Pope, uh, since they both recognized the authority of the Pope, to help them settle who is going to explore what territories. So uh, they signed the Treaty of Tordesillas, which will separate control of the newly discovered lands. And it basically draws a line across the globe. You look at this map, you will see the, the line, um, and that line shows you everything to the west of the line, which is to the left of the line, will be left for Spain to explore, and everything to the east of the line, which included the you know coast of Africa as well as Brazil, since they had already um, started landing there, will be for Portugal. Portugal and Spain continue to expand their uh, empires, but emerging maritime powers, um, naval powers like France, England, and the newly rising Dutch Republic began exploring as well. And so we will have new comers to the age of exploration race, if you will, race for riches. John Cabot was a Venetian explorer who ultimately was hired by the British or uh, English crown to explore the New England coastline in North America. The writings of a Florentine map maker, Amerigo Vespucci, um, will lead to the use of the name America for the newly discovered lands in the Western Hemisphere. He actually sailed for Portugal. Um, in France, we have Jacques Cartier, who explored the St. Lawrence River region of Canada and North America um, between 1534 and 1541. And in the early 1600s, the Dutch East India Company, which was a joint stock company of businessmen who also collaborated with the Dutch government to dominate the spice trade, they will challenge the um, control of the spice trade in India um, that Portugal had claimed uh, a generation or, um, or two before. And ultimately, the Dutch East India Company will expel the Portuguese from many of those East Indian and African territories, as well as some North American ports. And uh, the Dutch will come to dominate some of those areas that had been dominated by Portugal in the previous century. Now, I mentioned before that the Spanish will establish ultimately a colonial empire, which is different than what the Portuguese had established as a trading post empire. The difference is a colonial empire is where the Spanish will send over Spanish people to settle in these new territories, to dominate these new territories, not just economically as establishing trading posts, but actually settling and cultivating the land and ultimately ultimately um, taking the land for themselves. So we call this a, the Spanish Empire, which is really a colonial empire. 
And this is largely not due to the explorers. The explorers found the territories, but it will be the conquistadors, the Spanish conquistadors that will be set to um, penetrate the territories. Once they had been discovered by the explorers, the conquistadors or conquerors will go in and conquer the native populations in these areas to establish the colonial empire. So conquistador meaning conqueror, establishing this overseas empire. So how do they do this? Well, with a combination of guns, germs, and steel, the Spanish will conquer the natives of Mesoamerica and South America. Those three G's, gold, glory, and God being their motives. The germs that the Europeans brought over with them, the carriers of diseases like smallpox in particular, will be especially devastating to the native populations. The guns, um, steel, and those kinds of things will also be helpful to conquering the native populations as well as pacifying them with uh, Christianity, with Catholicism in particular. Um, these will all be useful tools, but germs probably were the most um, impactful. The European diseases, the um, native populations in the New World did not have immunities to these diseases. And as the Europeans brought them over, they will devastate those native populations. Upwards of 90% of the native populations will die off due to exposure to these European diseases. Again, diseases like smallpox. Uh, this also, as we will see in a later slide, will um, uh, force um, a need for different peoples to be brought over to be a workforce, and that will initiate the African slave trade, which is, of course, part of the big downside of this age of exploration. Now, in 1519, one of the earliest and most, I guess you would say, infamous of the Spanish conquistadors was Hernan Cortez. He and his Spanish allies uh, were welcomed into the area that is now Mexico in Mesoamerica into the capital city of the Aztec Empire, Tenochtitlan. Okay, the Aztec, the Aztec monarch at the time was Montezuma. Um, they were invited in because they initially were um, seen to be sent by the Aztec gods. Uh, so they were invited in, but after they were invited in, the Aztecs realized fairly quickly that they were here to dominate and to conquer. There will be uh, a lot of warfare between uh, the Spanish conquistadors and the Aztecs. Uh, the Aztecs, um, the territories that they had already conquered in Mesoamerica, uh, those other uh, native populations did not really like being dominated by the Aztecs, and eventually the Spanish conquistadors will use that to their advantage. They will actually convince some of those conquered peoples that they would fare better uh, if they joined with the Spanish to help overthrow the Aztecs, and they were making promises to them as well that they would give them freedom. Of course, they never delivered on those promises. Instead, the Spanish will use uh, those native forces to uh, take over and dominate completely. The Spanish will um, uh, were expelled uh, initially by Montezuma, but as I said before, they will eventually, by 1521, be able to recapture the territories and the Aztec Empire will be completely destroyed. As I said before, the European diseases like smallpox will be um, especially devastating to the native populations. Um, and ultimately, that will be one of the reasons why this the Spanish conquistadors were able to completely take over Mesoamerica, dominating um, what is now Mexico and defeating the great Aztec Empire. We see another Spanish conquistador, another example of a Spanish conquistador uh, in 1530, just you know, a short 10 to 12 years later, 
uh, his name Francisco Pizarro, leading an expedition into South America along the um, western coastline, uh, and that would be the Inca Empire. Like the Aztecs, the Incas were no match for the Spanish diseases, the Spanish guns, or the Spanish horses. Pizarro will lead, establish a new capital for the Spanish colony that is established in this region at Lima. This is the region of Peru today. Um, Lima, Peru is still the capital of Peru to this day. After conquest over the Aztecs and the Incas, the two most fierce and dominant native populations in Meso and South America. Uh, the Spanish will be able to take over parts of both North and South America fairly quickly and fairly easily, especially when the diseases, the European diseases, devastate the populations. The Spanish will eventually establish their own system of colonial administration, meaning how do they direct these colonies? How do they govern these colonies? They govern these colonies through um, a system called the encomienda system. And this basically was the Spanish crown granting the right of those conquerors who now have come and taken over these lands, now they're calling themselves landowners. They were able to use the Native American populations as laborers. Um, they did not refer to the natives as slaves, but they were basically slaves. Uh, ultimately, as I said before, the, the European diseases will wipe out so many of the native populations that they will eventually need to import new workers over to work in these plantations, sugar plantations in particular, and this will be the beginning of the African slave trade. Spanish landowners, as I said, in the encomienda system could use Native Americans for labor in return for uh, protection and converting them to Christianity as well. That also became part of the encomienda um, process. Native Americans, uh, the political and social structures that they had for centuries in these regions before the Europeans came were completely torn apart and replaced by these European systems of religion, language, and governing structures. The exchange, however, of plants and animals, as well as diseases, between Europe and the Americas became known as the Columbian Exchange, named after Columbus, the first explorer in the name of Spain to land in the New World. As you can see by looking at this map, there were lots of uh, foods, plants, animals, etc., coming from um, the New World that would be introduced to Europe, and it will have a huge impact on the European um, economy uh, as well as the European diet. But there are also things that came from Europe that were introduced to the New World as well. Um, goods, plants, animals, as well as diseases. Uh, European diseases like smallpox that will devastate native populations, but there will also be diseases from the New World that will be introduced to Europe. One of them is syphilis, a very terrible um, STD that will be transferred to Europe and devastate um, uh, some parts of the European population as well. Now, there will be, of course, rivals on the stage, like I said before. The Portuguese and the Spanish started this process, but they will find new rivals in the Dutch Republic, French, and the English for trading rights and for new lands in this new world. I mentioned before that the Netherlands uh, will eventually, they had been dominated by Spain for years, but eventually portions of the Spanish Netherlands, as they were called, will wrench themselves free of Spanish control and will form what is known as the Dutch Republic. These Dutch will eventually start to sponsor voyages to come to the New World. Some of them will be uh, um, sponsored by the government itself, the Dutch Republic itself, but others will be funded by Dutch merchants in the East India Company. Trade is basically a um, joint stock company where 
businessmen can pool their resources together to help fund uh, a voyage, whatever percentage of the initial costs a businessman invests, he will get that same percentage of the return when goods come back from the new world. So the Dutch East India Company will compete with the uh, Spanish and Portuguese already um, in some of these areas. Uh, also, they will compete with the English who are also sending voyages over to the New World um, uh, and as well as sending folks into the Indian Ocean trade networks. The Dutch actually will, as I said earlier, come to dominate the uh, spice trade in India. They will form also the West India Company to compete with the Spanish and the Portuguese in the Americas. So the Dutch will have the East India Company primarily in the Indian Ocean Trade Network and the West India Company competing with the Spanish and Portuguese in the Americas. By the early 17th century, the Dutch were able to establish settlements in North America, such as a place called the New Netherlands. Eventually, uh, they will establish a capital called New Amsterdam. And eventually when the British will come and they will take that territory from the Dutch, they will rename um, that area, New Amsterdam, they will rename it New York. In the 1600s, the French will get involved in this race for um, the age of exploration by coloni colonizing parts of what is present day Louisiana and the regions also of Canada. They will eventually dominate most of the area uh, in the central part of the United States, what is the central part of the United States now, as you look at this map, uh, establishing um, the territory that is known as New France. The English will also send voyages over and begin to settle the eastern seaboard of North America, uh, as well as the islands in, of the Caribbean Sea, um, fighting against the Spanish for control over those Caribbean islands. In 1664, the English, as I said, will seize the harbor of New Netherland uh, and New Amsterdam from the Dutch, and they will rename it New York and dominate that region. It will, that region will uh, no longer be called the New Netherlands, it'll be called New England, and of course New York as the uh, most important port city in that region. Now, trade, colonies, and mercantilism. Mercantilism is the economic um, uh, system, economic system that will dominate uh, European nations at this point in time, um, because these European nations are desirous of bringing as much wealth into their countries while limiting the amount of wealth exiting their countries. That is the whole point behind mercantilism. It is strict government control of the economy to maximize wealth coming in and minimize the amount of wealth going out. Not free enterprise, but government, strict government control of the economy. The slave trade will also increase as part of this mercantilist policy. Um, it'll also increase as enslaved Africans were brought to the Americas to replace those native populations that were decimated by the European diseases. The nations of Europe created trading empires and established colonies, some trading post empires like Portugal, some colonial empires like Spain, England, um, in France. Uh, most, the most profitable North American colonies were located in the Caribbean because that is where sugar plantations will be established. Uh, sugar plantations became, that was a major cash crop for the Europeans. Um, initially, it was largely dominated by Spain. Uh, and the 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 production of sugar is very labor intensive. And as the native populations died off because of European diseases, as well as the workload for um, harvesting the sugar, more and more African slaves were brought over to these sugar plantations. Colonies were an integral part of mercantilism. As I said before, it's an economic theory based on wealth, gold, cash, 
uh, and the limited amount of wealth that exists in the world. So as a nation, as a king of a nation, you want to make sure you control the economy of your country to maximize the amount of wealth coming in, minimize the amount of wealth going out, since there is only a finite or limited amount of wealth that exists in the world. Gold and silver from the New World being brought into Europe will be part of that as well. Colonies also provided raw materials as well as markets for finished goods that were being manufactured in Europe. Now, when I say manufactured at this point, I'm not talking about the factory system, automated factory system. Manufactured just means to make something and things are still being made by hand, but more and more the raw materials um, from the new world will make it so uh, they can, the Europeans can make more of those goods, as well as they hope that the colonies that they establish will now purchase the finished products. They can take the raw materials from the New World back to Europe, manufacture them into uh, goods, and then sell those goods back to their colonies in the New World. To bring in more gold, nations try to have a favorable balance of trade. That's part of mercantilism. Mercantilism means favorable balance of trade, where you uh, export more goods than you import. That will mean you are bringing more money in than you are letting go out. Because if you are exporting your goods, you're selling your goods to other nations, which means you're getting cash in exchange for those goods. So more wealth coming in, less wealth going out, means more goods being exported and fewer foreign goods being imported. You want to encourage your own populations to purchase your home goods rather than purchasing goods from other nations. To, so you limit the amount of imports. And you do that by taxing imports, making imports more expensive. To encourage exports, governments granted subsidies and improved transportation systems to businesses that will produce goods that other nations want to increase the amount of wealth coming into one's country by exporting more of those goods. You see cash crops um, as well as farming and trade, those are the dominant um, economic uh, factors in those parts of North America. Now let's talk a little bit more specifically about the Colombian exchange that I mentioned in the previous slide. European exploration, beginning with Columbus, who sailed for Spain, led to the emergence of a global economy for the first time in history through sea trade. The global trade network known as the Columbian Exchange included the global diffusion of agricultural products, animals, diseases, and even humans. You can look at this map and see what goods were shipped from which territories and what goods were brought in from other territories. New World products like potatoes, corn, tomatoes, tobacco, peanuts, vanilla, chocolate, turkeys, and even diseases like syphilis made their way from the New World into the Old World or Europe. The introduction of horses from the Old World, however, was introduced to the New World. And the introduction of horses will change the cultures of almost every Native American group. Once they can use horses, especially you see in this picture here, they can, um, that the buffalo hunt becomes much easier for them. So that was another thing. Columbian Exchange. As I said before, the Columbian Exchange also brought diseases from the old world to the new world. Um, ultimately, this will, these diseases like smallpox will decimate Native American populations. Upwards of 90% of the Native populations in Central and South America in particular died of European diseases. 
the Amerindian um, depopulation also will happen as a result of this, uh, these diseases. The, this depopulation created huge open spaces, ultimately, for Europeans to conquer and settle with little resistance. Old world products will be introduced to the new world as well as part of the Colombian exchange. Old world coffee, different kinds of sugar, and that sugar eventually uh, is seen that it can grow very easily in the um, Caribbean climate. Wheat, rice, cows, horses, pigs, sheep, goats, chickens, and of course diseases like smallpox, measles, and diphtheria. But a lot of European colonists also will come to settle in these new areas as part of the Columbian Exchange. And of course, African slaves will also be brought over as part of the um, Columbian Exchange. New crops will revolutionize Eurasian diets. New crops coming from the New World, being introduced to the Old World, will change the diets of the European um, and Asian populations forever. And ultimately, this will lead to unprecedented population growth. Finally, the Europeans will be able to recover from the population losses that they experienced during the Black Death Plague in the 14th century. Sugar plantations along with gold and silver will ultimately be responsible for enriching Spain first, since they were the first ones to uh, take these territories in, North, in, in the New World, but eventually the rest of Europe as well. So continuing to talk about trade colonies and mercantilism, the slave trade. Slavery had existed in the world since ancient times, and African slaves ultimately will serve as domestic servants in Southwest Asia before they were ever, ever brought over to the New World. But the demand for slave labor changed dramatically with the introduction of sugarcane in the New World. Labor was needed to work those sugar plantations. Sugar became a major cash crop that would be imported into Europe from these Caribbean islands in particular. Uh, so Spain will need labor to work these plantations where the sugar cane was grown, especially after about 90% of the native populations who had been working on those sugar plantations died. So that will be the impetus or the catalyst for the um, increase of the African slave trade. The Africans will be brought over from Africa by those Portuguese who control a lot of the, um, the trade ports along the coastline of Africa. They will exploit the tribal differences between different African tribes, uh, purchasing the captured you know, uh, prisoners of war from other tribes and then bringing them over uh, to the New World. This is the dark side, the bad part of this Colombian exchange, ultimately. Slaves became an important commodity in what will be called the triangular trade. This is part of the Colombian exchange, but specifically dealing with slaves, it's called the triangular trade. And this triangular trade connected Europe Africa and the Americas. As you see here, raw materials like sugar and gold and silver uh, coming from the New World going to Europe, then manufactured goods going to um, Africa, and then slaves coming from Africa to the New World. American sugar, rum, codfish shipped to Europe in exchange for silver, then shipped to Africa in exchange for slaves then slaves sent to the Americas. This is all part of mercantilism as well. Slaves were bought and sold as chattel, which means property, and the African kingdoms were eager to trade slaves for goods with Europeans. As I said, lots of tribal warfare uh, will be exploited by the Portuguese and Spanish and eventually the English and the Dutch and the French as well to get those slaves into the new world.
Uh, as many as 10 million African slaves may have been brought to the Americas between the years 1500 and the late 1800s. One reason for the high number of exported slaves was the high mortality rate, um, especially in the journey over from Africa. This journey over is known as the middle passage, it's the middle portion of the triangular trade from Africa to the New World, the journey across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and this journey was devastating. Uh, slaves would be packed into these ships, um, so many that they couldn't even breathe, uh, and many of them will die in the journey. As many as half will die on the way over, and never even making it to the New World. Uh, the slave trade will devastate the population of African communities near coastal regions, um, especially along the western coast of Africa. This African diaspora, which basically means the spread of mostly African men to the Americas, also helped lead to the depopulation in Africa of these tribes and the weakening of the patriarchy in these areas of Africa. It will have long-term effects on the African population and culture as well. Some African rulers, such as King Alfonso, uh, protested this slave trade, but were ignored by other African and European slave traders. There was so much tribal warfare going on that it became a way for some African tribes to make money by selling off the prisoners of war uh, from competing and fighting with other tribes in Africa. So unfortunately, that will, the slave trade will not be diminished until the later 1800s. The effects of the slave trade? Well, terrible effects, obviously. Um, it depopulated many areas within Africa. It did increase warfare between those tribes because now they had a need, another motive to fight with their uh, with other tribes. They could sell the prisoners of war to the Europeans. Uh, it also created the loss of the strongest and youngest men and women in Africa. There were some areas as well that will be impacted um, within Africa. Benin. Benin had been a brilliant society, had had um, a lot of cultural significance during the post-classical era. It will be transformed from a flowering culture, from a brilliant society into a brutal war-ravaged region following the introduction of the slave trade, the Europeans trading slaves to take to the New World. The use of enslaved Africans was widely accepted until the Society of Friends began to condemn it in the 1770s. Eventually, European nations will start to abolish the practice of slavery, the French abolishing it in the 1790s, the English formally abolishing it in 1807, but still slavery continued in the United States until the 1860s. Just instead of importing slaves in from Africa, they uh, promoted the African slaves that were already there in the New World to reproduce so they could have more slaves in that way. So the slave trade within um, the United States and in the New World will continue even after slavery is outlawed by most of the European nations. Now the Portuguese and the Spanish, as I said, will build different kinds of empires, in some cases colonies, like you see mostly with the Spanish Empire, in some cases trading post empires, mostly with Portugal. Um, in Latin America, we see these will profit these nations um, because of the resources and trade with their colonies. In the 1500s, Portugal uh, controlled Brazil in South America. That was really one of their only colonial territories, not just a trading post area, while Spain's colonial possessions throughout Meso and South America, and even part, portions of the southern part of North America, like Florida in particular, okay, will help bring more and more wealth into Spain. The area of Central and South America became known as Latin America because of the Spanish and Portuguese exploration of that area. 
uh, and a unique social class system emerged as a result of the intermingling of the Latin or Spanish and Portuguese populations with the native populations. A social hierarchy called the Casta system will be created in the New World, um, basically a pecking order uh, formed based largely on the skin color. And this still remains, although watered down, it still remains largely in Latin America to this very day. We'll discuss each of these um, levels on the Casta system as we go through the remaining slides. The Peninsulares were at the top of the pyramid, and they were folks that were, had been born in Spain or in the Old World uh, and uh, moved to the colonies. So they were fully born in Spain um, and moved to the New World. Below the Peninsulares were the Creoles. Creoles were Spanish, Spaniards still. They were still fully Spanish by blood but they were born in the New World. So they had two Spanish parents that were most likely Peninsulares, and then those two Spanish parents um, you know, gave birth to them, but they were born here in the New World. So they were below the Peninsulares on the um, pyramid. But the Peninsulares and the Creoles, since they were all of European blood, no native blood in there at all, they dominated politics and the economy in these colonies. Spaniards often took Amerindian or even African wives um, because there were few Spanish women that were able to make it over on the journey. So the children of those uh, uh, biracial couples will have middle level status in the Costa system. Okay, so that the, the uh, multi-ethnic uh, peoples, there's several different kinds. First, you have the mestizos. Mestizos were European and native Indian mix. From a Spanish man and an Indian woman, a mestizo is produced. Zambo was where you had African and native population mixed. A Zambo was when a black man an African slave and an Indian woman mixed. And a mulatto was where a European and African mixed, a black man and a Spanish woman or a Spanish um, man and a black woman um, from the slave population mixed. And the populations of these biracial folks soared in the new world. Amerindian or increasingly African slaves filled the lowest ranks of the Casta system. Colonial empires in Latin America, the social order, as you see, this is just reiterating what we said in the previous slides. Peninsulares were Spanish and Portuguese officials born in Europe, uh, holding all of the important government positions. Creoles were descendants of those Europeans who still had pure European blood, but they were born in Latin America. They controlled a lot of businesses and a lot of the land. Mestizos were the offspring of European and Native American intermarriage. Mulattoes were the offspring of Africans and Europeans. And as we know, there were also Zambo that were the combination of the African slave and the Native Indian population. Conquered Native Americans and enslaved Africans were always at the bottom. Now, Europeans also utilized Native Americans as labor, as I said, prior to the diseases decimating the population so much that they had to start the slave trade. They used the encomienda system that we mentioned before, as well as another system called the Mita system to sustain a viable labor force. Gold and silver from the colonies offered immediate wealth to the Europeans. Products such as tobacco, sugar, and animal hides were traded to Europe in return for finished products again as well. To control their colonial possessions in the Americas, 
Portugal and Spain used governor generals to develop a bureaucracy and to carry out the policies of the kings and queens at home. As I mentioned prior, when I talked about the motives for the age of exploration, God is one of the motives. This is where this next part comes into play. Catholic missionaries were also sent over from Europe into these territories, and they were instrumental in converting the native populations to Catholicism and maintaining order within colonial territories as well. The Catholic Church provided an outlet other than marriage for women as well. Many nuns like Juana Inez de la Cruz urged convents to educate women on subjects beyond religion, even within the new world. This will be very radical for the time, will not really take off for many, many generations, but show, goes to show you that uh, there were some women who were pushing for education and uh, better education for women as early as this Renaissance era, 1500s.